with the India Habitat Center, uh, the Energy and Research Institute, Terry, uh, Vigyan Prasal, and, and Safipra. Uh, these institutions center, and the idea was that India Habitat Center and the institutions at the uh, Habitat Center should come together to create greater awareness about the magnificent initiatives and accomplishments that India has in the realm of science, technology, and innovation. Couple of years, uh, uh, last couple of years, we are seeing several movements in terms of how the frontiers of science and technology are getting more and more embedded in the economic uh, uh, structures that are uh, unfolding. And with that, we are seeing coming in in a major way uh, that uh, uh, we are seeing the economy moving forward. Uh, as we used to hear about the knowledge economy, it is now coming forward uh, uh, in, a, in a major uh, uh, sort of uh, way where we feel the need to understand science, technology, and uh, we have seen the huge media coverage and the magnificent developments that are there, which are quite fascinating in terms of how STI could play this role. And there could not have been a better choice than uh, uh, Professor uh, Vijay Raghavan himself uh, shaping the STIP policy 2020. But much more than that, uh, he has brought in together in an accelerated manner the transformation of the SNT management skills, the transfers that are needed uh, uh, from uh, uh, dividing not only in material that is needed, the programs that are needed, and collating them together uh, to have the maximum impact of the startup uh, processes uh, that connect within the government agencies and also uh, bringing together uh, uh, the pre-pandemic that the Indian uh, policy regime exhibited uh, through these difficult times. And, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan has accomplished that very well. Uh, uh, today, uh, what we have planned is that I would uh, request uh, uh, my uh, colleague uh, in the science diplomacy program at RIS, uh, Ambassador Baskar Balakrishnan, who was our ambassador in Austria and in Cuba, uh, to introduce the STIP lecture series. And we have requested uh, Mr. Sanjay Kirloska, uh, uh, who runs a very known for uh, quality products and uh, uh, manufacturing with um, strong knowledge base. So we thought that uh, giving Prime Minister's idea of Make in India, how STIP is going to connect, which is uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan's uh, sort of... The other thing that I enjoy with Dr. Vijay Raghavan is his uh, great commitment in terms of connecting social science with natural science and how the two can uh, feed into each other. So social scientists are uh, understanding and learning about science technology and... Uh, we thought uh, um, uh, Mr. Kedroskar would be a great choice. I see that Mr. Sunit Tendon has joined the director of the India Habitat Center. So I would first offer him to make uh, a few remarks and then I go to uh, Ambassador Bhaskar Balakrishnan. Thank you very much. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. I, I'm absolutely delighted that the STIP lecture series has been uh, started once again in a virtual format. Uh, we had it for over two years uh, in uh, the actual uh, format in uh, Habitat Center and the pandemic. And to the, the, those of your team, we have managed to start uh, this uh, series again. And we are very, very thankful to you for all the efforts made and to all the other organizations which are collaborating to make the STIP series possible. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, uh, uh, acquaintance at the India Habitat Center. We have met him several times. He's lectured earlier also. And uh, it's a great pleasure that such an eminent speaker is speaking in this first of our virtual STIP meetings. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Karluskar, thank you so much for taking time out for uh, chairing this particular meeting. 
to express my thanks to Professor Chaturvedi, to Ambassador Bhaskar Balakrishnan, and all others at RIS for taking this initiative. I must also say that I'm afraid this uh, uh, I have a bit of a clash, and I have to excuse myself. I had said I'd come in just for two minutes because we had already scheduled a meeting of a committee. So, if you, if with your, if with your indulgence, I will seek your indulgence to let me kindly excuse me now, and I'll go and join that meeting. But I'm delighted that this series is revived again, and I wish you all the best, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tendon, uh, for uh, India Habitat Centers consistent sure uh, the days would come back when we would avail Habitat Center facilities to hold uh, more of these meetings uh, in physical form rather than in virtual form. So Certainly. we would enjoy your hospitality and we look forward to that. So I look forward. Thank, thank you. you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. May I now request uh, Dr. Balakrishnan to give us an, uh, a quick idea of the STIP lecture series. Uh, thank you, Sachin. Uh, it's a great honor to welcome all of you to the 29th in our lecture series on science, technology, and innovation. Going live. So we have been holding the SCIP lecture since September 2017, uh, every month. And today's lecture is actually the third anniversary of the SCIP lecture series. As mentioned by Sachin, this is a joint effort by six institutions, Habitat Center, indo French Center of Sefipra and Vigyan Prasad. Each have contributed to the series, bringing in their own series of expertise and enriching the series. We have also published a volume of the lecture series, making it available for the wider community. The last was held on 28 February this year, and since then it has been suspended on account of the COVID situation. Now, we are very glad to be able to now resume our science, technology, and innovation policy lecture series in the online mode. We hope that this new format for the lecture attracts wider participation, including global participation. A YouTube link has been included in the webinar so that those who cannot attend in real time can see the proceedings and also comment on it. In this way, we should be able to turn the COVID crisis into an opportunity. Institutions for joining us in this revival process. For today's lecture, we are honored to have as the chief speaker, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, principal scientific advisor to the government of India, to speak on makeup, making of India's STIP policy 2020. The importance of this. Vijay Raghavan is coordinating the efforts to fashion a new STIP policy for India that will take the country forward in the next decades. We look forward to his insights into the ongoing process and its objectives. Uh, for our online audience, uh, a few words to introduce the principal scientific advisor to the government of India, as well as the chairman of the scientific advisory committee to cabinet. This places him at the center of India's science and technology policy making and foresight. Earlier, he was secretary of the Department of Biotechnology from 2013 to 2018. And did his research work at TIFR Mumbai and Cal California Institute of Technology, Caltech USA. He set up the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore in 1992 and continues as a distinguished professor and distinguished in developmental biology. Award such as Padma Singh in 2013, Matnaga Prize in 98, Fellow of the Royal Society of UK in 2012 and Foreign Associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2014. To chair today's session, we are greatly honored to have Mr. Sanjay Kedros, the chairman and MD of the largest business and industrial group. That is practically a household name in India. He is also the president of the All India Management Association. He was educated at the Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago, USA. And interestingly, he set up an all women class of Kirloska brothers at Kibitor. His presence symbolizes the energy that is available for exploitation between government and business in the transformation of India in science, technology, and education. It is business that has a crucial role in translating STNI into products 
broad and also in supporting cutting edge business focused research. There are many other stakeholders who play important roles in science, technology, and innovation, such as researchers and institutions, financial actors, regulators, and indeed civil society. They have all been involved in the consultation and a look at the Science Policy Forum gives an impressive evidence of it. This lecture is an attempt to reach out to all of them. Uh, I now hand over the mic to Mr. Sanjay Kerlosko to chair the session. Mr. Kerlosko, please. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, RIS for inviting me to moderate this session. It's a great honor for me to do uh, uh, to moderate this session with Dr. Vijayaraghavan, as I have known him uh, for a few uh, years now. I shall be mindful of the fact that we have another 49 minutes or so. I was uh, president of All India Management Association until last week. So Mr. Oh. Harshpati Singhania has taken over from me last week. Uh, Dr. Vijayaraghavan, I have been told by uh, the Director General of RIS uh, that the topic for today is our government's policy on science, technology and innovation, as well as I uh, have been told to open up this discussion and speak for about five minutes or so, so the audience can hear your presentation. And I will speak especially about what indus industry is expecting, so in the beginning itself. So as we know, our Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Council specific uh, science and technology domains to understand what our challenges are and to formulate short, medium and long term policies as well as reforms. Uh, these are basically to ensure preparedness in emerging domains to create an enabling ecosystem for entrepreneurship and fostering effective public private partnerships to drive research and innovation, amongst other things. I believe, uh, Dr. Vijayaraghavan, you're also looking at developing science, technology, and innovation clusters, and looking at improving skill sets for current and future technology. There are nine missions uh, that you are working on. So I'm happy to see, therefore, the emphasis that our government is placing on science and new technologies, and to develop a scientific mindset. I'm sure this will lead to Indians in India creating new innovations for the world to the rest of the world. When our citizens and our companies are able to do this, resulting in the creation of global Indian brands, uh, this is when we will gain influence and soft power around the world. So at the same time, I mean, uh, let me to Dr. Vijay Raghavan. I'd like to pose two questions for the then, for, for the here and now. Right? And this is to understand how we can move away from the current mindset. Uh, as has been mentioned before, I run one of India's uh, oldest engineering companies, which has been making in India since 19... ...independence, when the British ruled us. Uh, the company that I run made pro many products like centrifugal pumps, diesel engines, electric motors for the first time in India. These products were designed by Indians and orders were placed by customers, including government customers, which... Now, you know, what we see, especially in some industries, oil and gas, for example, there's a reluctance to use Indian design products unless we have what is called a proven track record. And how can we get a proven track record for new products, new designed products country, unless customers in our country buy these products. You know, in many cases, what my company has had to do is go to get, go and get orders abroad, right? And we've got abroad from companies like Saudi Aramco, Samsung. And the question that we are asked in these times is why don't, and we have to tell them about this concept. And I was wondering whether there's something that also needs to be changed in the government procurement policy of government companies. Uh, so that products designed in India are encouraged uh, in India. Because if we do not give a chance to products designed over here, citizens even attempt innovation. And, you know, my uh, company also designs products for the nuclear sector and makes them for the first time in India. And we've never had this problem. So this is one. The other question that I have is, it relates to defense because both 
security are not only important, but being self-reliant in these areas means we've developed technology in these areas. And the question is about manufacturing uh, for defense-related stuff in India. We see that Indian companies are allowed to participate in contracts, but this has taken very long. Uh, fellow Indians to develop technologies or keep secrets. And I agree that many new technologies need to be mastered over here, and we need to be at the cutting edge, especially for defense. But look at the way China, Brazil, and other countries have built up their capabilities. And how would you recommend that private to bridge the gap? So that is the second question that I have. So Dr. Vijay Raghavan, we are all looking forward to hearing your views. Uh, I'm sure there's be a la large number of questions after your remarks are over, which I will moderate in, along with uh, Mr. Chaturvedi. Uh, they will appear in the chat mode, so everyone I'm Dr. Vijay Raghavan. I hope thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanjay uh, Kirloskar. It's always a pleasure to be there with you. Uh, and you've formulated the questions very nicely. Thank you to Mr. Chaturvedi, Mr. Balakrishnan. And um, you know, what I will try and do is to be uh, briefer than I initially thought I would be, because you have so completely uh, comprehensively frame the questions that I think there would be greater value by having than my rambling on. So my ramble, therefore, I will restrict to just two or three broad points. And those points are, where did we come from? How are we and where are we now in terms of our... And where do we go from here along the lines of the important points you've stated? Now, very briefly, where did we come from? India is one of the unusual post-colonial countries that and technology um, post-independence at the cutting edge. Uh, this started a little prior to independence. Um, and it also went on after independence. Uh, so our major science establishments, the Indian Council for Medical Research, the Indian Agricultural Research Institutions, the um, uh, CSIR, the Atomic Energy Establishment, the Space Establishment, each of them had a start very early after independence. But we must keep in mind because other post-colonial countries in Africa, in Latin America, rest of Asia, didn't invest to this extent at that time. They also, interestingly, didn't invest hugely in uh, public They started doing that a little later. Many of those countries, however, at those stages did something which is antithetical to what we would consider as a approach to self-reliance. They actually were in the world to come in, resulting, I'm talking about countries such as Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Philippines, and so on and so forth, many African countries, resulting in a increased commercial activity of a diverse kind, of local entrepreneurs uh, and so on, but allowed an economic growth which helped primary education and health to grow. Then, depending on how much each of these opened up opportunistically to different sectors, Korea in one way, Taiwan in another way, um, these places you know, grew enormously anchored on science and technology. Right. So that was the model they followed. We followed a model where we did something which I think we could have done better, which is technology. We did not pay enough attention for a country of our size on two things. One is primary and secondary education of quality, health access of quality. And actually, I would add to that a third thing, 
mindset. Our mindset nationally was divided into two components. Those who were well-to-do in urban areas, who like we're doing now primarily spoken English and had a view not only the ability to be prosperous, but the prosperity of the rest of the country was at their benevolence and at their mercy. And the attitude of the rest was not sufficiently liberated that they found quality ideas, solutions come from this sector, and they come when you are rich and when you speak in English. In other words, we lost the pride and the ability to have abstraction and analysis and debate and coordination and acceptance in our languages. Our languages were constantly lowered down in the intellectual sphere, and English took a greater and greater dominance in the intellectual sphere. The result is today, we have the mindset which Mr. We don't have faith in the quality of what we can produce, even in situations where we can produce, because our elite, and I include all of us over here, have a knee-jerk response that quality must be demonstrated, and only then is it something of quality. Originality has taken second seat, and therefore, we have largely, even when we export quality people and over here, become with extraordinary exceptions, attuned to serving the interests of our employee in an extraordinarily successful manner at the cost of originality and risk of failure, which is necessary for growth. This is not something which is. Uh, uh, can be redeemed quite well, and countries all over the world have done well at this. I mean, there have been times, for example, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, but each accused of being imitative economies in terms of their technology. And Israel, for some time, was thought as being so deeply linked to American uh, foundations that it could not be innovative on its own. That's proven wrong. The Scandinavian countries have you know, shown big economies how they can be extraordinary. The big economies are fight. So it is possible, but at the heart of this, whether it is procurement policy or defense or any other sector, is a change in mindset. That change in mindset is the only thing which is necessary compromise, it'll come and so on. That mindset change is still different. That mindset change needs to have two components. One, at the core of science and technology, and this was said actually in 1935 in a speech with Mahatma Gandhi gave at the he praised the Maharaja College as being a center of high science and learning and extremely well equipped. And he said that he admired the pursuit of science for science sake. But he also said it's important for students to roll up their sleeves and get things done on the ground and be innovative. And we have seen examples of some industrialists. Sanjay mentioned know, the Kirloskar family, the Tatas, several others, who went on and took these challenges and did wonderful things. That now today, that shared sense of and independence times needs to come back. So that's a mindset change. Now, I'll, I'll summarize very briefly now the situation today and how we can go forward. The situation today is therefore a mixed bag. It's not all something which we need to be more. Take any area in science, technology, or innovation. The plus side today is within India, you will find in our institutions quality people who can understand anything in any subject, right? Now, the reasons for that are twofold. 
Indian to excel drives them to learning and knowledge and understanding, but also the tools of learning, knowledge and understanding are more readily available and they have become centered more substantially on design of various kinds, whether it is or semiconductor design or equipment design. Design dominates uh, the core of manufacturing uh, and therefore it liberates our relatively fragile uh, experimental ecosystem from being we have by accident <clears throat> and design we have got a large number of people who are extraordinary capable. the result of that is many big multinational companies have established their primary R&D centers design centers here but they've established not as embedded research structures here, which are open and innovative. These cost centers contribute to the growth of the company, and they do, and the companies do extraordinarily well, and that is good. But we need to add such kind of centers in every Indian company to scale. <laughs> the growth of our science-based industry and our scientific enterprise is pulled down by two or three aspects which are not substantially related to science itself. Sanjay mentioned, you know, procurement and rules and mindsets keep changing and they are changing. But simultaneously, we need to look at our cities and our livability. If we are to grow, then we need to make our cities livable and our environments more conducive, to take issues of climate change, transportation, crowdedness, all that. Bangalore grew as a science and technology hub. Pune grew as a science and technology hub in no small measure due to the attractiveness of those cities for reasons. The Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and the public sector undertakings in Bangalore and the other institutions grew because Bangalore had this reputation of being a comfortable, welcoming, cosmopolitan city uh, for every kind of person as well. Today, it has become a very different science of cities all over the country. That brings me to our science clusters and various kinds of clusters. Each of our concentrations of scientific enterprise, Pune, Hyderabad, Bangalore, the National Capital Region, the Mumbai Pune Corridor, the corridor, the Delhi Chandigarh corridor, Kolkata and the Northeast, each of these need to become welcoming as cities, but also simultaneously, they need to become interactive amongst each other. Now going to the future, all this is very well. The tragedy of the situation today is when I say that we find, when you go to any institution, extraordinary people who understand anything, we tend to become satisfied because of a certain are not good or bad compared to the rest of the people in an institution, in a city, or in a country, but we are as competitive as being one step ahead of the fiercest competition anywhere in the world. That requires us not to be superb in our understanding, also to be ahead of a globally competitive pack. Now we can get ahead of a globally competitive pack by two ways. One, which is a way which we have to fight. Every country does that. It fights for its trade benefits in a manner which gets the maximal benefit within the law. Every country therefore interprets intellectual property agreements, trade agreements, and so on, within the law, within global laws, but to its benefit. And those kinds of frictions, tensions will continue, and each country must put In addition to that, there is a scope for extraordinary innovation driving our successes, and they are the following kinds. As I said before, in today's world, design plays an important role. If you go to a small village in Switzerland, 
not, it's not unlikely that you will find opening a bar door an extraordinary set of instruments and manufacturing capability of a small company in that barn ma making components which are really very precisely machined for interestingly if you go to yashwantpur or parts of pune yashwantpur in bangalore or parts of pune you will find similar companies you will find in the midst of the urban turmoil you will find a small company making components for airbus or for ford so it is not the ability to manufacture used to be very very strong that will now get disrupted because two things have happened the covid pandemic has disrupted global supply chains and reconfiguring them in interesting ways but also now manufacturing to manufacturing will move very close to the sites of actual use labor arbitrage and cost arbitrage will no longer be dominant the reason is manufacturing has become cheaper it's possible to do it in an automated manner very close to lies design and therefore indian manufacturers now small medium large need to go into design in a really big way whether it is a design of a semiconductor chip or a design of a shoelace or a design of apparel or design high end high quality precision design of every component and function needs to be the core when that is done you manufacture prototypes at your factory and your intellectual property comes from export of that design to anywhere in the world at the click of a mouse this also therefore is the future for our industry if you look at there's there's a guy shridhar vembu who's got a company called zoho he's moved it to a small village in tamil nadu he trains local people who are from local engineers right and he then exports his software all over the world i'm not saying for a moment that software export is the key to to solution no i'm saying software and design of hardware prototyping of hardware selling that hardware nationally and having design at the core as a solution this therefore leads us to the next step of the solution that solution comes for by massive skilling in foundational technologies now which are empowering computer critical thinking analysis you know of one's context therefore history economics sociology all of that is important and therefore the national education policy and the national research foundation should drive that clusters of cities should work together on complex in addition to addressing important problems of our context and industries should have a pre competitive space where they collaborate with each other collaborate with academics and a competitive space where they go out on their own these kinds of approaches will be very valuable hydrogen fuels fuel cells you know, various kinds of power sectors and so on and so forth uh, water agriculture where the space and market internally is enormous so these all require a novel approach and all of this is eminently feasible everyone will agree on this done we will come back to the mindset issue and that mindset issue just as all revolutions are strangely led part of by elites this revolution also must be led by the elites who's changing the mindsets of the elite will change the mindset of the entire population and therefore our politicians our bureaucrats our industrialists our scientists need to come together with a shared purpose of how we can go ahead and do something and not because it may have this problem or that problem the safest airplane is one which never takes off but that is not our goal our goal is to get things done and have this aircraft take off thank you very much thank you uh,
the way you uh, spoke about, uh, you know, where were we, where, how did we start, where are we now, and uh, where do we go from here? And I'd rather, you know, speak about, you also spoke about our insularity and our sense of satisfaction. But uh, when I was uh, younger, or all of us were younger, when the U.S. denied us a, a supercomputer, uh, saying that we would use it for uh, defense purposes, right here in Pune, uh, we were able to make a supercomputer and uh, use it for uh, weather prediction and uh, all that uh, we wanted to do with that. And uh, I also have has purposely put all its factories in rural areas. And we have 3D printers, we have designers using the latest software. I mean, Indians are no different from anyone else. We are just as capable, given the right uh, direction, as uh, anyone else. So let me take uh, the first question. Gautam has said, uh, when you talk about software, I'd like you to emphasize on free and open source uh, software. I don't know whether this is a question, but uh, do you have any comments on this? Uh, absolutely, you know, uh, free and open source software. And this is also a problem of our own entrapment. Uh, just as with, you know, a variety of manufactured products which we use, branding has also taken over importance in software. With the result of this, um, have a free and open source automobile a scooter or a bicycle and have that done. And the market could be in theory dominated by such products. Uh, but in practice, branding turns out to be critically important. Uh, that has also happened. We have enormously expensive uh, proprietary software of various kinds, which end up being used in enterprises on huge scale in a situation where Stimulus to free and open source software would have been fantastically valuable. Uh, it will collapse because it's an untenable structure in the long term, but it might collapse with new kinds of software and new kinds of technology overthrowing it rather than by reform. Okay. Uh, Mr. Amit Kumar says, what could be the orientation of uh, software Innovation Policy 2020 towards issues on access, equity, and inclusion in science and technology and innovation. Will uh, STIP 2020 initiate steps on enhancing access, promote and support equity, and support greater inclusion and inclusive? I would urge you to take a look at the national education policy, which has been approved by cabinet. And this issue is substantially addressed there as also a component, a chapter there about the National Research Foundation. Both these have important the science, technology, and innovation policy. Basically, the issue is what I said earlier, that 90% of our research funding goes to 10% of our students in central institutions and central universities. Universities, where there's, and colleges where there's very little research in any subject, in humanities, science, and so on. So we need an injection of resources into that system, into the broader system, to open up the doors of opportunity, inclusiveness. And resources there will not work because absorbability will be tough for a while. Therefore, we must have a mechanism where literally hundreds of mentors of quality go and seed networks of inclusion places all over the country and that's what is supported and then over a five ten year period you will see that the footprint of science in particular and research in general has expired this is what many countries have done china has effectively done that more recently the u.s started it up European countries have done that by spreading science. There used to be, um, you know, famously there was a quotation that when someone went to university in um, England, they were asked, which one of the two did you go to? Uh, as if there were only two universities in England. Uh, but now that, that 
Corporate excellence is an important matter, but that needs to be consciously pushed. And the uh, new education, the national education policy, and the STIP both push that. Thank you. Uh, Sneha Sinha uh, has a question. Uh, she Will uh, STIP 2020 be with harnessing uh, science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development goals? What will be the implications of STIP 2020 in terms of achieving the sustainable development uh, goals, particularly in post-COVID India? A critically important question. Uh, sustainable development goals have been there for some time now. But the timeline by which we're supposed to meet them has not changed. And the question is, how are we doing over there? Now, in many ways, those goals allowed us to make investments in various kinds of energy, education, health, agriculture, and so on. But till 2019 end, those were made in a particular context where the boundary conditions economics, global uh, pressures were wound in a rope, which either helped us pull ourselves up or were something, sometimes a danger when they were tied around their neck. That braid has come under that we now have both the opportunity and the danger, if you don't grasp that opportunity, of reinventing what a pace towards sustainable development goals will be. There is a fundamental problem there in that when we whether in the public or private sector or education or anything, we want quality for the lowest price. And therefore, we end postponing the payment of environmental costs and climate change costs, health costs and education costs the cost of being able to manufacture something now and sell it cheap, then we're paying an artificially low price now, but our future generations will pay a high price for lack of education, lack of health, poor attention to climate change, poor attention to environment. If we price up so that these aspects can be paid for, then the speed of attainment of sustainable development goals can be rapid. If that pricing goes in a manner where these funds go to the government for taking action, that is a, I would say, 20th century view of looking. Is a corporate mechanism in partnership with society, enabled by the government to have this pricing done so that the benefits go to the people in a much more spread out and quality manner. This is a challenge. It's not clear to me what the roots are to so that corporate involvement in societal change and sustainable development goals is quite should be a lot more enmeshed with government as a facility. Okay, okay. Uh, so Sachin Chaturvedi would like to ask a question. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Uh, today, I wanted to ask you, uh, and since you just mentioned SDG, we had the opportunity of uh, uh, having you. Uh, connect STI for SDG at the global level, and you were generous in terms of bringing in some of the African countries. But my question to you is more about that, uh, the debate that we are hearing. In fact, uh, just last week, uh, uh, there was a conference uh, which President Xi Jinping uh, attended, and he said, uh, uh, science has no borders, but scientists have motherlands. And if you go to Europe, uh, you find Parliamentary Secretary uh, saying that they are planning for uh, European research area. So my question to you, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, is that in this world, when at the one end you are you yourself provided a leadership at the UN to create global public goods for STI SDG uh, uh, with science uh, uh, protection walls that are coming in. How you see? STIP 2020 balancing and your own priorities uh, are getting redefined. Thank you. This is a interesting and 
you know, for a moment, leave aside the nation as our point of reference. Look at individuals in institutions or institutions themselves or industries in specific countries and so on. Or do they serve their society? What is the definition of their society? Is their society national or international? Right? What, in other words, what is our commitment? And is there a conflict of commitment which comes up? That conflict is not there when we serve someone else. And science is interesting in that situation. There is an open aspect of science which comes from debate, discussion, accord and discord, which is essential. That open accord breeds such wonderful science is something which is cultivated over many, many years and is a deep embodiment of society. I mean, there have been many old Indian institutions over history which have had that. We have created not sufficiently, not enough, but we have that. There's been a post-war resurgence in Europe and America, which has that. And we must therefore look at the context of what you commented about what China said in that situation. How then, if technology is essential for development and SDGs, do more totalitarian governments succeed in science and technology. Isn't there a contradiction, right? Shouldn't they therefore not be successful in science? What state does therefore is something which is unusual. It is not sufficient to invest heavily. It is not sufficient to have processes which are industry friendly or not and so on and so forth. It plays to the openness in a manner which The spirit of openness requires a shared moral ground, a shared sense of values, and a shared understanding of what one does and what one doesn't. If you violate those standards in international collaboration, science and technology, by standing without others' knowledge on the shoulders of the enormous investment which open societies have made, Right? Create a scientific structure which is powerful. Right? That poses great global imbalances. To Europe's credit and to America's credit, even in colonial times, the scientific structures, the basic foundational scientific structures, were relatively. The growth of ideas and technologies, which even might be designed to overthrow those structures, those colonial structures, right? That is not the case with totalitarian scientific structures. They are designed not to allow the free and debate and so on and so forth. Now, India has been amazing over historical time. This is something we should take pride in. We have always loved debate and discussion, and we have contributed more recent our human resources and talent, and in a very open manner. But never has India, India has not used this extraordinary breadth of its diaspora and its strength to anything but to serve a shared moral purpose and shared global goals, doing things. So, you know, multilateralism and a serving of humanity will come. It is the right thing. And temporary misuse of, you know, power structures uh, will not survive. Uh, your comment on debate and discussion brought to my mind uh, Amartya Sen's book, The Argumentative Indian, where he uh, <laughs> describes so vividly uh, our culture and our society over the last, uh, I don't know, 2,000 years or so. Uh, but, you know, when you talked about these totalitarian 
science and technology. One of the things that uh, when we were now, when all of us were really young, was one moment was that Sputnik moment. And uh, the US realized that it was far behind uh, the Soviet Union as far as uh, technology was concerned and the space race was concerned. And President to launch a man on the moon within 10 years. Uh, which he succeeded in. And there were so many uh, things that came out of that uh, space program. Do you think uh, that something like that would be useful? Uh, one overarching goal for our country where... You know, I, uh, the answer is yes, but, you know, what is that overarching goal? Uh, because, you know, our challenges are multifarious and require attention to multiple components. But today's to everything, usually it's not. It's sociology, economics, politics, all of that play a very important role. But today, unusually, technology plays an important role because it allows for the perhaps the first time in recent human history of knowledge. Historically, knowledge has meant power in every society. Today, there is an unusual opportunity to make knowledge accessible to everyone. And if that is our one principal goal, that the two the arts, engineering, can be accessible to everyone in their language, in a manner where they can empower themselves, and they are not at the mercy of someone else who is rich or well-meaning or powerful or educated to tell them what is good for them, then, then now that's the principal summary of the national education policy, of the National Research Foundation and so on. Everything else follows suit from that. Skilling, jobs, what to teach, what not to teach and so on. But you are your own owner. That is something every Indian, therefore, their own owner. Okay. Let me take one of the questions from the Q&A. Uh, Ayurved has huge potential in healthcare innovation, and a lot of evidence is already available. However, the mindset of a majority of policymakers is still not open to look at it. And on this, to improve the health uh, status. Um, you know, I'm, I would move my laptop around my office, but in the interest of time, I won't do that. I have murals here from the Hortus Malabaricus, 18th century in you know, 1640 to 1680. It is a 12 volume survey of all the Ayurveda in the Malabar coast, 12 volumes written in Latin in collaboration with the Vaidyas of Malabar. Of Malabar at the time, um, Van Reed, and translated in the 20th century by K.S. Manilal, a, pro a professor at Kerala University. K.S. Manilal got the Padma Shri this year, belated. He's in his 80s and he's quite ill. But the point is you go through, there are no shortage of plants over there, from whom, so the, the volume is brilliant. It has the plant, it has a drawing of the Vaidya, it says this is what comes from the plant. It's got that, you know, the summary written in four languages, Arabic, Brahmi, uh, uh, Urdu, uh, and, and uh, Malayalam. And so you can, you know, figure out everything. And many, many, many of these plants have now got contributed to active reagents in modern medicine. In other words, that tradition in two ways. Both practitioners of what is called modern or evidence-based medicine and practitioners of Ayurveda need to change their mindset. And that mindset requires one to accept the exploratory nature required and how it has to be substantiated and the other to be willing to accept that certain things will work and certain things will not. The key feature of science today is not about what it succeeds in doing, but the willingness of science. 
right? The key feature of many other systems is to keep on insisting that something works irrespective of what the evidence is. Conversely, the key feature of a feature of modern medicine is to insist on systems of testing which are not fundamental to the claims being made. So all these need to come together. There has been a great tradition of them coming together in India in the past. It needs to be revived. Chinese traditional medicine and Chinese and modern science have come South America also. We need to take this up, otherwise we are doing ourselves no service. There is gold there, both in terms for society and for the economy, and that needs to be brought out by a partnership. Okay, and I think vaccine for COVID is being developed. We patient, the trials, and the ability to accept that it may not work. So the last question, if you don't mind, because I'm mindful that there are only three more minutes left, but you, you have given us a little extra time, uh, is from uh, Sunita Tripathi. Uh, she says, how does STIP aim to achieve for and by India? And if there are any ideas of nurturing, especially grassroots innovation in the areas, including health, so and self-reliance may need open collaboration across stakeholders domestically. So, uh, any comments on that? Over the last over a decade, um, many grassroots innovation organizations, both independent and supported by the government, which have done incredibly well. Many kinds of such grassroots innovations have taken today is there was a mindset which thought that grassroots innovations must be limited to simple technology. Today, grassroots innovations, it's possible to have cheap innovations. In other words, what it goes back to the point I said earlier, that one needs to empower innovators so that they're not limited by their local easily picked up wisdom, which is very important and critical, but apply global knowledge to that is the big challenge now. So while the Jaipur foot is an extraordinary innovation, no question about that, we now have the opportunity to have thousands of such innovations, some of which may use electronics, some not, some metallurgy of new kinds, lightweight materials of other kinds, problem. Here are the ways by which global solutions can come about need to be there. Now, there are many efforts globally to allow access to this information which is happening. And the science, technology, and innovation policy, and also, again, particularly the national education policy, lays great stress. And a combination of both will allow these tools to be accessed more broadly. There are a lot of organizations and structures which provide these innovative tools so that you can use them in your solutions on the internet. But I must say that while, you know, in terms of being able to access this, it's valuable, it is not sufficient by any means. You need trainers and people at the ground who bring to local communities in health and agriculture and transport, all the kinds of technologies. There have been an high-tech, frugal innovation to happen on scale. These two innovations are the availability of power. Solar power, wind power, other, you know, hydrogen zone, you know, regular electric grid power. All of that means that, you know, power supply will be available. Water also should be available everywhere. This allows, because of a revolution in power transistors, it allows motors which drive on low voltage DC, 48 volts DC, to be feasible to do all sorts of things which were impossible. Yeah, manufacturing of high quality combined with design coming through the internet or going through the internet will revolutionize local innovation. So we must look at grassroots innovation, not just, very importantly, must have more Jaipur foot, but also have the highest tech coming from 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, session. You were there exactly on time and you've given a, a very insightful address about the work that is being done. Uh, I'm aware that uh, I think now, uh, Mr. Chaturvedi, I, I could hand over to you the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiloskar. I would request my colleague, Dr. Uh, Ravi Srinivas, to propose vote of thanks. I also acknowledge the presence of uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, uh, who also joined us uh, in this. Professor Sharma? Yeah, uh, so I, I was here for the last half an hour. I probably missed the, the first part, which is uh, so I was into uh, all these discussions and the interactions which were going on to discuss but i think you are winding up now so i would not take any more time uh, i mean you could discuss a uh, grassroots innovation for minimum 10 hours <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then maybe we have started warming up to it <laughs> there are so many so many wheels within a wheel and i uh, of course i totally agree with the observation of professor vijay raghavan uh, that uh, you know uh, we, we have been thinking, uh, when we think about grassroots, we have been thinking mostly Jugaad. And we often equated Jugaad with grassroots. To, you know, you, you live today to die another day, but it's not optimal. It's not producing optimal results. Uh, a lot of this so-called rural technology, which has been developed uh, over many decades, has not found very widespread is that it's a little bit of jugaad here there's not a very deep understanding of what goes on there uh, so i think we have to shift gear uh, from jugaad which is not scalable it has been shown it's not very scalable it's not optimal and it's not widely acceptable so put in some more a regular streamlined dhanda and some amount of panga I think that might be able to take care of things. So disruptive, being a little bit disruptive, being a little bit more stable in our business and so on. So, uh, you know, you know, National Innovation Foundation. Uh, and then there are, they, they have been very strong in what they do, but there have been also very many weak points. And it is the understanding of these weak points uh, which would propel our um, grassroots innovation and diversity forward. So I stop there. Sharma, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Ravi Shinivas uh, uh, to propose vote of thanks. Uh, uh, we have very limited time, Ravi. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank Professor K. Vijayawan for enlightening and as the answers which are given. We are not just thought provoking, but also deep thinking. I mean, he demands from us. Thank you very much, sir, for your taking time and then to talk to us on a such detailed manner. I also thank Professor Ashtu Sharma for his presence and gracing this occasion by making a small speech. I would like to thank from his busy schedule and also for chairing the session as well as putting the questions in the right way and then getting the answers as well. And then it is my pleasure to thank Mr. Sunit Tanner for his limited time presence and then for also telling us that IIC is there to support us. And I would like to thank Professor Sachin Jalavidi for his enormous support and everything for giving to us. I would like to thank Dr. Balakrishnan for introducing the uh, STAP lecture series as well as the partners. And I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Sati Devi from Sapipra, Dr. Manish Anna from Terry, and then Dr. Kinkini Mishra from Vidya uh, Prasad lecture series for now, three years for now. I thank my colleagues, Dr. Amit Kumar, Dr. Sneha Sinha, Dr. Kapil Patil for being there and also for taking the questions. I thank the IT team in RIS for their extensive support. I thank all the participants for the support. Once again, I thank them in helping us in reviewing this lecture form on a virtual mode. Every month now, there will be a regular feature and we look forward to your continuous support and Engagement with this. Thank you all. Thank you. I request the to stay for the for photograph with the speaker. Please stay online. Thank you. Thank you.
So we can now click for a photograph uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. And uh, as uh, we have done in the past, this lecture would be published by India Habitat Center as part of a series which is going on on STIP. And this would also uh, bring partner countries in Africa as India is preparing for India-Africa Forum Summit later this year. So thanks. I thank everyone once again. Thank you, sir, for your uh, kind presence. And, and we, uh, we partner once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs>